Hey, hey, everybody, and welcome back to the board meeting, to a very special edition of the board meeting, because today I'm going to be going through my top 100 games of all time, as of 2023, and it's in the middle of June 2023, so halfway through, and this is the third time on video that I'm going through my top games of all time. Uh, when I first started this channel, I did my top 50 games of all time. La at the beginning of last year, I did my top 100 uh, games of all time and I broke that into 10 videos and now a year and a half later I'm finally going to redo my list and since then I've played probably since a year and a half ago I've probably played close to 400 more new games that weren't that I, that I hadn't played before so this list is going to be a little bit different than before I, it's it's really fun to go back and look at these lists throughout the years and even before I made these videos uh, making my top games of all time I had, I've actually made a list of my top 100 games like four years ago. So I've got like four years of data or to go on. Uh, not that it's going to be shown on here, but it's really interesting to look at how the list evolves and changes throughout the years. How my personal uh, preference on board games change. And I know like when I first started in playing board games, I really, really preferred the big, heavy euro style games over anything else um those were the ones that seem i seem to like a lot now it's i have a lot of different games whether they're you know big heavy games little card games solo games worker placement deck building euro amerithrash i like all the games i'm an omni gamer i like i give every game a chance and you'll see a, quite a variety of games on this list and uh, well, with that being said, let us just jump into it because I'm going through all 100 games today. I'm not breaking this into any 10 videos like I did last year. I'm going to go through all 100 games. So bear with me. I'm going to try to go through these games quite fast. I'm I'm not going to try to linger on these games too long. I don't want this video to be too long for you guys to watch. So let's just jump into number 100, the, the game that just barely made this list, and it's a little card game. This is Regicide. Regicide is actually just a deck of cards where you are playing out these cards trying to kill the royalty of the deck. You're trying to kill all the jacks, then kill all the queens, then kill all the kings, and then you win the game. And you're playing these cards, and the cards' numbers and the suits matter. You're going to get special abilities for the suits, and the numbers are going to be how much you're attacking for. They're also attacking you at the end of your turn, so you're going to have to play defensive cards as well. And you can just get a regular deck of cards to play this. I've got the official game that you need that you can play with, but you can just play this game with a deck of cards. Really good, solid solo game, as well as a little cooperative game. Going to So number 100 is Regicide. Going to number 99. 99 is a game that not a lot of people talk about. This is Cosmic Colonies. Cosmic Colonies, you are playing out these cards, and these cards are going to have numbers on them and then an ability. And it it's kind of like Citadel style, where you're going to be counting down, and whoever's got the highest number goes first, or it might be the lowest number goes first, and then you're going to go through the list, and those people are going to do those abilities. The, the things that you're doing, basically, is taking resources or spending those resources to buy these tiles to place on your, your game board, your own personal board, and you're trying to cover up these spots that are actually going to give you negative points at the end of the game. And so you want to cover up these spots by using these tiles. Really good game, pretty simple to get into, and not a lot of people talk about. So 99 is Cosmic Colonies. Going to number 98, 98 is Power Grid, also known by me as Math the Board Game. You In this game, you math is very, very important, and I love math, and I love using my brain for, for math problems, and that's what this game feels like to me, because you're going to have to math up how much you can spend to buy a power plant, which is going to power your whole grid. You're going to have to math out how, you, how much you can spend on different resources to power those power grids, uh, to power those power plants. And then you're going to math out how much you're going to need in order to expand your city. And then you want to expand to different cities, building more power plants, power, getting, expanding your power grid to get more money at the end of each round. So 98 is power grid, math the board game. Going to number 97. 97 is a game that has dropped because it's a little bit heavier, uh, harder to get to the table than the other games in this series. This is Paladins of the West Kingdom. It's one of these games over here. I like all the West Kingdom games. This, spoiler alert, is my least favorite game out of the series. 
but it's still really, really good. In Paladins, it's a worker placement game, but all your workers are different colored meeples, and you can only use those meeples to put on different certain spots to use the different abilities of those spots. And you're going and getting points through a whole new slew of ways all the time, and there's just a lot to do in this game. So number 97, Paladins of the West Kingdom. Going to 96. 96 is a flip and write game, and you'll see quite a few of the flip and write games on this list. This is Trails of Tucana. In Trails of Tucana, you're basically mapping out or going through the section on your own personal board. You're going to flip over two terrain types, and you're going to draw a line from one of those terrain types to the other one that you flip. And you're trying to basically draw lines from your little home bases into these different uh, signs on that are on the board. And you're trying to connect them to the home base because you're going to score more points. You sc If you connect a couple of them, you're going to get an extra bonus line to write on that board. And I just think it's a really good game. 96 Trails of Tucana. Going to 95. 95 might be the most unique game on this list to me. This is Brian Boru, High King of Ireland. This is a big board game that is area control, but you're doing all the things through trick taking. And if you once you play a trick, the person who wins the trick gets to place one of their little circles, their area control circles in that section. You're, like I said, you're trying to control the different areas, but also the people who are losing lose the tricks are going to gain several things that so a lot of times you want to lose the tricks to gain these little bonuses and there's a couple different tracks that you're going to be trying to move up along the way because you're losing these tricks so it's a very strategic sort of trick taking area control game very unique i think but very very good uh 95 brian boru high king of ireland going to 94 94 back to a little card game this is parade i would say parade is sort of a classic card game at this point in Parade, you're basically, you have a lineup of cards, which is your Parade, and you're going to play out a card, and that card's number is going to skip however many cards that card is, and then after it skips those cards, it has to take all the cards that are equal value or less or of the same color uh, for that. And you don't want cards in your lineup in for your own personal thing. You This is the game low score wins. So you're trying to avoid taking cards and other people are trying to take cards. I think it's a really solid game. And yes, so 94 is Parade. Going to 93, 93 is another little card game. This probably is the simplest game on this entire list. This is Point Salad. I have taught Point Salad to so many people and it usually always works really, really well. Point Salad is so simple to teach. There is a grid of vegetable cards and on your turn, you're either going to take two of those vegetable cards or on the top of that grid, there's going to be scoring cards. You can either take two vegetable cards or one scoring card. And those scoring cards are very simple to explain. It's like uh, three, a carrot equals three points and an onion is negative one point. So for the rest of the game, you're trying to take carrots and avoid onions. Very simple game to teach. And I think it works really well. And it's still a game that I feel engaged with when I'm playing it. So 93 was point salad. Going to 92. 92 is the quest for El Dorado. In this game, it is a deck building racing game. You're building out your deck and it's a very, very easy game. If I was going to teach a deck building game to someone who's never played one, this would be probably the game that I would choose because it is so simple, especially to start off the game. You basically have cards that you're getting that are terrain types and you're going to play those terrain type cards to move through that particular terrain on, on the map and you're just trying to race till the end it's a great game to teach uh, people deck building for sure so 92 the quest for el dorado going to number 91 91 is an abstract game that i think doesn't get a lot of love i talk about it a lot on this channel this is noctiluca noctiluca is a great looking beautifully looking abstract game that has a bunch of dice on the board and you're basically placing out a worker on the outside edge of that board and taking dice in straight lines from that worker that you just placed and you are taking dice of the same value so you you say i'm going to take th uh, three and then you're going to take all the threes in that line of those dice and they're going to be different colors you're going to place those dice onto your noctiluca card trying to fulfill those basically contract cards in order, and just to score points. I think it's great, and it's very highly underrated. 91, Noctiluca. Going into the 90s now, we are going to go with a small card game again. This is Ecosystem. 
so 90 is ecosystem it is a simple card drafting game where you're going to take these cards a la seven wonders style you take a card pass all, all the rest of the card take a card pass all the rest of the cards and you're placing these cards that you've taken into a grid eventually you're going to have 20 ca different cards in your grid and they're going to be like animals basically and those animals are going to score points for different things they're going to score a lot of points for adjacency rules and all the animals have different rules of how they're scoring and it's a pretty simple game actually very a simple game but it's very thinky of how you want to place out these animals into your grid how you're going to build that out very fast game as well so number 90 ecosystem going to number 89 89 is marvel remix a Marvel Remix is a retheme remake of Fantasy Realms. And in this game, you are basically going to start with a hand of seven cards. And then throughout the game, you are going to be drawing a card or taking a card that's in the discard pile and putting that in your hand and then discarding a card that's in your hand. So at the end of the game, you're still only going to have seven cards. All these cards are going to work with their cards. You're trying to have all these cards work well with each other get score points off of the different things that are in that card and like this card's going to score uh ten, five points for every wakanda forever symbol that is in your line of cards so you're trying to get these cards to work well with each other uh after there's so many cards in the discard pile then the game is over you're going to count all your points i like this one more than fantasy realms because i think it's a little bit simpler there's not as much scoring where fantasy realms you could score like 300 points in this game it's you're doing pretty good if you score 100 points. So I, I like that the scoring's a little bit calmer in Marvel Remix over Fantasy Realms. So going to number 88. Number 88 is a new game, and it's right here, actually. Or a Chalchkum. In this game, you are going to be drafting these, these cards that have tiles on them. You're going to do the cards ability, and then you're going to place the tile out on your board. And you're racing to get five points. I've realized I really like these games that you're racing to get a certain number of points and one thing that this game does it has temporary points if you build three of the same tra terrain types connected with each other you're going to get one of these gods card god cards and that god card is going to be worth a point but they're, they're temporary some other person can build three of that terrain type and take that god away from you it's one of those games that when one person is so close to winning because you're it's raced to five if someone has four points, everybody's like, okay, we have to stop him from getting that fifth point. And I really like games like that. Uh, so number 88, or Chalchkum. Going to number 87. 87 is a game that took quite a drop in the last two years because I think the, the genre that this goes into has become flooded. This is terraforming Mars. And there's other games that are like this game that have kind of pushed this game up. I still really, really like terraforming Mars. Big tableau builder where you're terraforming Mars, you know, bringing up the oxygen level, bringing up the heat, stuff like that. And I just really like the, the the tableau building of this. The thing that keeps this game on this list, actually, is the solo mode. Out of all of those games, Terraforming Mars, I think, is the best solo mode because it, it just lets you do your own thing. Hey, we're not going to mess with you. Just go and Terraform Mars. So I really like the solo mode in Terraforming Mars. Going to number 86. Number 86 is a tiny little solo card game. This is Grove, a nine card solitaire game. You could have either, you could have put Orchard on here. Grove is the sequel to that. And in this game, you're basically, there's only nine cards and those cards have different fruits on them. You're trying to overlay the cards on top of the other cards with the same like type of fruit on them. And you're, you're going to, more times you overlay these cards, you're going to get more and more points. It's one of those games that I really like to play late at night, right before I go to bed. I'm like, okay, I'm going to play a game of Grove quick. And it literally takes like two minutes to play this game. And I absolutely adore it, the simplicity of it, the ease of it to get it out. And, you know, that's important in these games. If, if they're too difficult to play and too long to play, they're not going to get played that often. This does definitely does not have that problem. Uh, going to number 85. Number 85 is also a card game. This is Ohanami. You, it is a drafting game where you're drafting numbered cards into your little area. You have three columns that you can place these cards in. And once you place a card, so if you place the 87 and then you place the 83 on top of it, you can no longer place the cards in between those. So you can't place the 84 through 86 in between them anymore. And you're going to have to play on the bottom or the top of that column. And it's just a very simple game. The cards have different uh, color types on them. And each round you're going to score different colors. 
and it's just a really good solid game to show people and one that I still really like. So 85 was Ohanami going to number 84. Number 84 is a Roll and Write game that is a remake of a bigger game that has replaced that bigger game. This is Dinosaur Island Rar and Write. Dinosaur Island is a big, giant game table hog that I had, and I got rid of it because Dinosaur Island Rar and Write. It gives me that same feel of building out these dinosaurs, building out a park, but it takes up a tenth of the space. I sold Dinosaur Island, and I like Dinosaur Island, but this giant game is just easier to get to the table, and it doesn't take up that much room. So number 84 was Dinosaur Island Raw and Right. Going to 83. 83 is probably the most popular push your luck sort of game out there. This is the Quacks of Quedlinburg. In this game, you are building out a, a bag of these chits. And everybody during a round, they're going to be drawing these chits one at a time, placing these out. And you don't want to bust. So you're placing out these chits, and hopefully they don't have these these gray numbers on them, that's going to count towards your bust score. So you're trying to place as many of these chits out, and at the end of the round, whether you bust or you don't, you're going to be able to spend points to put new chits back into your bag, upgrade that bag into bigger, better chits. And one thing I do like about this game is even if you do bust, you're going to get something. You're not going to fall that far behind. And there is some catch-up mechanisms in this if you do fall behind. So I think that's great. So number 83, yes, 83 was the Quacks of Quedlingburg. Going to number 82. 82 is a water theme game. This is Aquatica. Um, Aquatica, you are going to be buying, getting these locations, whether you buy them or conquer them. And you're going to put them on this dual layered board and these cards are going to have other symbols on them and it's very much a combo game like this card you can slide up and you're going to get an extra two coins to buy new locations or buy new characters or this one's going to get you extra conquering power so you're going to slide that up and it's it's just comboing things one after another i mean there's turns where you're like okay i'm going to do this and then i'm going to do this and then i'm going to do this and then i'm going to do this and it all just works really well i love those combo type games and you're going to see a lot of other games that do this combo type thing but aquatica looks nice and it feels nice and it's very fast so number 82 was aquatica going to number 81 i said i like the look of aquatica this game does not look very good this is ethnos ethnos is this area control game and i would say it's just as simple as like a ticket to ride you're basically either drawing cards drawing a card to put into your hand or you're going to play out these cards these cards are like fantasy uh creatures uh fantasy races you're placing out these cards in order to put out your little tokens on different areas and you're trying to have the most tokens on these areas to control them because you're going to score points every round for them I think it's a great game. I heard they're reprinting this, retheming it. I'm very excited for that because this game does not look good. I'll say that. So number 81 is Ethnos. Going to number 80. Number 80 is another game that looks fantastic. It might be my favorite board game cover that is on this list. This is Earth. It is a new game, and it's one of those games that has brought terraforming Mars down, like I said. But this one, you're like a tableau building. You're getting out the all these earth cards the whether they're animals or plants or whatever and you're just building out that tableau activating all the things in your tableau this is just positivity of the board game because everything you do in this game is just positive even when other people take their turns you're going to get a lot of stuff on your turn and activating those different cards uh so number 80 is earth Going to number 79. Number 79 is Neuroshima Hex 3.0. This is this game where you're playing out. It's a, a two-player game. You're playing out these little people from your faction, and they're going to have numbers on them. And during the game, you're going to activate cart the, the, the tiles in order, and these tiles are going to shoot and do different things, activate different abilities. And you're just basically trying to eliminate the other person being doing the best possible thing you can and i just think it's a really good game that not a lot of people talk about anymore so number 79 neuroshima hex 3.0 going to number 78 number 78 used to be extremely extremely popular i don't hear a lot of people talk about it anymore this is a game that i played a ton with my kid back in the day and we haven't played that much anymore we still break it out like once or twice a year this is King of Tokyo. King of Tokyo is this dice-chucking Yahtzee-style system where you are playing as monsters and you're trying to take out the other monsters that are in Tokyo 
or you're trying to score points. It's the first person that scores 20 points through their dice or by eliminating the other monsters because you can either attack people with the dice or you're going to get points with those dice. You can either heal as well, but I think it's just a fantastic game. I have a lot of fun playing this game, especially with my kid. Now, number 78, King of Tokyo. Going to number 77, going back to a card game, this is Claim. This is a two-player trick-taking game that has two phases. In the first phase, you are going to play, be playing out these, these cards. And the cards, the, the suits of these cards, are fantasy races. And the fantasy races are going to have different abilities. But you're going to be playing out this trick, trying to beat the other person. And whoever wins gets to take the card that is face up in front of them. And whoever loses takes the card that is face down on the deck. And so some cards, you, some tricks you actually want to lose because you're like, oh, that's a bad card that's face up. So hopefully you're going to lose and take the card that's face down. And hopefully that card's better. After you've played out all your cards, you're then going to take all the cards that you won in the previous, previous thing to play out the hand that you're actually going to score with. And you are trying to get the majority of each of these fantasy races in order to gain the point for them. And the person who's won the most fantasy races wins the game. Great two-player trick-taking game, Claim, which has got a ton of expansions and a couple editions of it. Going to number 76. Number 76 is also a card game that has two phases. This is very interesting that these are back-to-back. -back. This is for sale. For sale, you are going to be auctioning, auctioning off these basically estates. And these estates are numbered like 1 through 50, something like that. And so you're auctioning off those. After you've played out your, or auctioned off all the cards in that deck, then you are going to go to the, uh, the other phase in this game, and you're going to be using those estates that you have in order to try to win these money cards. And you're trying to get the most money each section. You're going to place these cards face down. Whoever's got the highest estate gets to take the highest money value card that's out there. Fantastic introductory game for sale. Going to number 75. Number 75, back to a board game. This is the Lords, Lords of Waterdeep, which is a worker placement game. I would argue this is one of the most simplest worker placement games that is out there. But it's still engaging. Uh, on your turn, you're just going to be placing out one of your workers on these spots. The spots are very simple at first. And it's like you're going to take two black cubes or two orange cubes or a, black, a purple cube. And then you're going to use these cubes in order to f fulfill mission cards that you have. And these cards, you know, these missions are like, okay, you need to turn in a couple of these different cubes. And then you're going to get so many points for them. And throughout the game, you're actually going to build new worker placement spots, which I think is great. And... It's just a very simple worker placement game that I have found that I still enjoy just as much as I did years and years ago. So number 75 is Lords of Waterdeep. Let me uh, move down this list. Going to number 74. Number 74 is Habitats. Habitats, in this game, you are going to be building out your habitat. Uh, you, are, you have a jeep on this grid, and you're going to either move forward or to the sides of that jeep and you're going to take the tiles and put these tiles into your own personal habitat, building out this giant area. You're trying to get certain types of habitats beside each other to fulfill each of the tiles, and you're going to score a ton of points for all of them. Number 74, Habitats. Going to number 73. Number 73 is a cooperative game. Is this the first cooperative game on this list? I think it is. And uh, that's surprising because I love cooperative games. This is Thanos Rising Avengers Infinity War, which is part of a bunch of different rising games that are out there. And in this game, you are trying to either def you're trying to defeat the, the villains that are out there that Thanos is putting out, and you're also trying to recruit new heroes. And you're doing this a la dice rolling. And you are going to recruit these heroes, which are going to get you more and more abilities. They might get you more and more dice to roll. So at the end, you might be rolling tons and tons of dice. And you're either going to be, like I said, recruiting these heroes or attacking the villains by, by placing these dice on those heroes or those villains, matching the symbols that they need to hit them or recruit them. And I think it's just a great system. I like a lot of these games in this series. I think there's six of them now or so that are in the Rising series. But this is my favorite one that I've played. So 73, Thanos Rising, Avengers Infinity War. Going to number 72 now, 
We are going back to the Shem Philip games. This is not in the West Kingdom, though. This is in the North Sea. This is Raiders of the North Sea. This is a worker placement game where you are going to be placing out a worker and taking that action. Then you're going to be taking back a worker on a different spot and taking that action. So essentially, you get two actions each different turn. You're going to be building out a crew. Eventually, you're going to be going out into these villages and raiding these different spots and scoring points that way. I think it's an excellent game, and I love the system of putting out a worker and taking one back. So yes, number 72, Raiders of the North Sea. Going to 71 is a small little flip and write game. This is silver and gold. This is a game where you're going to be flipping over a shape, and that shape you're going to have to mark out off on your two treasure map cards that you have. And you're just trying to fill out these treasure map cards. Once you finish one of those, it goes to the side, you get a new treasure map. And you're just trying to fill out these as many as you can throughout four different rounds. And whoever's got the most points wins. There's a couple more little things that go along in this game. But I think it's a fantastic game. And it still gets played to this day. For as simple as it is, it's still coming to the table pretty frequently. So number 71, silver and gold. Getting into the... Uh, going to number 70... Number 70 is a card game. This is Enchanted Plumes. In Enchanted Plumes, you're going to be building out these peacock cards and building out their plume. And I just think it looks really, really good. It's got some chunky decisions in it. And it, it has replaced a game that I really, really like. This has basically replaced Lost Cities. Uh, it plays up to six players, and I think it plays really good at all player counts. And it's just got a lot of good decision making in it. And it looks fantastic out on the board. So number 70, Enchanted Plumes. Going to a very nice number, number 69. This is Mission Red Planet 2nd Edition. It's 2nd Edition. I've never played the 1st Edition. In this game, you are going to be placing, playing out these character cards and then doing whatever that those character cards are, are. And you're doing it like Citadel style, where you're counting down from the rockets. You know, you're going 9, 8, 7, and whoever played the 8 card, when the 8 number comes up, you're like, okay, that's me. And then you're going to do that character's action. And they're basically placing out astronauts onto these rocket ships. And you're trying to send these rocket ships out onto Mars, where you're then going to place these astronauts out. And it becomes an area control sort of game. It's very easy, very simple to explain. And I think it works just really, really well. So number 69, Mission Red Planet, second edition. Going to 68. 68 is part of a series of games but this is my favorite one so far of them. This is Legendary Encounters, an alien deck building game. In this game, you are basically building out your deck and you're trying to defeat the alien. Uh, but all there's several different scenarios in the, uh, the base box of this, and each of the scenarios basically is a different movie in the alien franchise. Uh, you could play the Predator one too. All, uh, most of these games I think are pretty much similar in that aspect. And I just really like it. It feels very, very thematic. What you're doing is what you're they're, you're supposed to be doing in the movies. And I think it just works really, really well. So Legendary Encounters, an alien deck building game, is 68. Going to 67. 67 is role player. I love the theme of this game. In role player, you are basically drafting dice, putting these dice into a grid. And what you're doing is you are basically building out your D&D character. And, you know, you could be a rogue dwarf with different different characteristics that you're trying to fill. And the board that you have, they want your different abilities to be certain strengths. So you're placing out these dice in these rows and like, okay, you need your strength to be at 17 in order to maximize your points for this. And so you're drafting these dice, doing the abilities of them. And I just love this game. I love the theme of it. Number 67, Role Player. Going to 66. 66 is a flip and write game. It is a big, giant, hip, heavy flip and write game. This is Hadrian's Wall. This is very much a combo game. Lots and lots of combos. In this game, you're going to get resources. You're going to spend those resources to mark different boxes on these two giant sheets that have filled with information on them. And it's like, okay, I'm going to spend a stone to mark off this. Then I'm going to get a purple meeple from it. Then I'm going to take that purple meeple, spend it over here to mark off this box, which is going to get me a yellow meeple, and I'll go over here and mark off this spot. And you're just combo with it, constantly comboing things back and forth in this game. And you're just trying to extend your round, marking off as many boxes as you possibly can, basically, in order to score a ton of points. 66, Hadrian's Wall. 
Going to 65. 65 is a giant Euro-looking game. This is Terra Mystica. This game looks like Catan on steroids, like a lot of steroids. And it is, it's got that grid on there. You're placing out different buildings on there. And it's one of those games, I think if I play this game more, it would be really, really high on this list. But I don't own this game, and I play it like once a year. And every time my friends explain it, or I, we play it, my friends have to explain the whole game to me again because I just kind of forget about how this game plays, but it's very crunchy, very, very Euro-style game. It's great, though. Number 65, Terra Mystica. Going to 64. 64 is Hadara. This is a drafting civilization building game, and it is it is like a bigger seven wonders it's a little bit harder to get to the table because there's a little bit more going on you're feeding people and you're just getting cards in different types and building out this basically tableau of cards and i think it works really really well i love how colorful this game is it looks beautiful on the game board or the table i think it is fantastic so 64 hadara going to 63 63 is a very small solo game this is sprawl opolis sprawl opolis you are going to be placing out these cards, trying to connect different thing, different parts of the city. And each game, you have three different goals of how you're scoring the game. And they're just random. So the game is going to change from game to game. It's one of these uh, pocket-sized games that has only 18 cards. But there's a lot of variability from game to game in this. And there's a bunch of games in the basically Opolis line now from Button, Button Shy. And I think they're all fantastic. But we'll just talk about Sprawlopolis. So... Number 63 was Sprawlopolis. Going to number 62, we go from a small button shy game to a giant big board game. This is Teotihuacan City of Gods. I love the look of this game. It is very elegant looking and there's a lot going on. You're going to be moving these dice that are your workers and they're going to age throughout while you're moving them. And there's a lot of ways you're going to score points. You're going to be moving up grids and you're going to be taking... Uh, these little pyramid pieces off and I love how the pyramid looks I just I think this game looks excellent I I never hear people talk about it but I think it just looks really really elegant and it's a giant giant game number 62 Teotihuacan going to 61 61 is a small little card game you're going jumping back and forth between these big heavies and these smalls and this is Cabo second edition Cabo is a memory type card game where you have got four cards in front of you and you are trying to basically get the lowest numbers in front of you until someone calls Cabo. Then you're going to reveal those cards to everybody else. And you try to have the least amount of points. Once someone has 100 points through several rounds of play, the game is over. I think it is fantastic. I break this game out a lot. I show a lot of new people this game. So number 61, Cabo. Going to number 60. Number 60 is a game new to me this year. This is the Court of Miracles. You are basically uh, placing out these worker chits out on these different spots and taking the action of that, trying to get control of these different areas. And if you control an area, you ha get that point for that area. And it's a race to six, I believe. When someone ha has six points, they, you're, you, they win the game instantly. And there are temporary points, those area control areas, and there's also permanent points. And I really like these games that have these temporary points. Because like, okay, this person's got four four or five points. And everybody else has got two. So everybody's like kind of gangs up on that person to make sure they can't get their last uh, points that they need. And instantly this game flips. It's like, this guy's got five. Oh, now he's got three and the other person's got five. So we have to switch and try to stop him. And I find myself, I really like these games. Kind of like Orichalchkin. But I, I like this one a little bit more than that one. So number uh, was 60, Court of Miracles. Going into the 50s now, 59, Clank Catacombs. This is the newest edition of Clank, and I think it's the best edition of Clank besides basically Clank Legacy, but we're not, I'm, I don't put Legacy games on here. But Clank Catacombs, it improves Clank, the original Clank game, in every aspect. It is this dungeon crawl work, uh, dungeon crawl deck building game and you're just exploring the dungeon trying to score points gathering up uh, cards that are going to score you points as well i think it is a fantastic game the newest edition of clink going to 58 58 is a solo only board game this is final girl i love love the theme of this i'm i love i'm a big horror fan and in this game you're basically playing the final girl and taking on the big bad guys of 
villain tropes that are out there. I mean, there's like a Freddy guy. There is a Jason guy. There's a Michael Myers guy. It basically hits on all the old 80s and 90s horror movie tropes. And I love that about this game. So 60, 50, no, 58, lost my place, is Final Girl. Going to 57, 57 is going to be Small World, or you could put Small World of Warcraft. Uh, Small World is basically risk with fantasy creatures and special abilities. You are going to be taking these fantasy creatures, and these fantasy creatures have a special ability, and they also have another special ability that is put onto them randomly, so there's a ton of variability in this, and you're going to be placing out these fantasy creatures out on the board, trying to get like the most area control of different areas on here. Um, I think it's fantastic. S Small World of Warcraft is just as good, if not better, but the Small World of Warcraft is like Small World with a couple expansions already thrown into it. If you were going to get any game, Small World or Small World of Warcraft, I would get the Warcraft one because it's a little bit more engaging, a little bit deeper in that. So going to number 56. Number 56 is Yamatai. I love the board game cover of this. I love the look of this game. It is very colorful. You have boats that you're going to be spreading around, trying to encircle islands in order to get the buildings and put place different buildings on these. I love how this game looks at by the end of it. It's uh, it's similar to Five Tribes. It started out as a Five Tribes sequel, but ended up going a little bit away from it. But you can definitely tell that there are quite a few similarities between this and Five Tribes. So number 56, Yamatai. Going to number 55, another really, really good looking game. This is Meadow. Meadow is this, basically you're building out a tableau of cards, or building cards on top of other cards, and you are drafting these cards by using the system that's like Quadropolis, where you're, you have arrows pointed towards this grid of cards, and you, you're trying to, you're going to take cards from that, place them in front of yourself, and you're building cards on top of other cards. Like, you're going to build the grass first, and then you're going to get the, like, bugs on that, and then you're going to get a bird that's going to eat that, and you're basically building that, like, ecosystem, basically, of those cards. I think it looks fantastic. It's it's one of those really good nature-looking games. So number 55 is Meadow. Going to 54. 54 is a small card game. This is Archaeology, the new expedition. In this game, you are basically going to be trying to gather up sets, and you're going to be selling sets, uh, buying sets, buying different parts to complete sets, and just selling them back into the, the museum area to score points. It's very easy to get into, and it is fantastic and engaging. It's one of my favorite little card games. Number 54, Archaeology, the New Expedition. Going to 53, 53 is a chess-like abstract game. This is Onitama. Onitama, like I said, it's like basically like chess. It's simplified chess almost, where you're playing these cards that are on your side and using those movements to move your little pawn pieces, trying to take out the other person's master or trying to get your master into the other per master's dojo. And you're playing out these cards. When you play a card, it goes to the side, and then you take the card that is in the side. So you're constantly flip-flopping these cards back and forth. Very, very thinky little card game, but very, very simple to explain. So 53 is Onitama. Going to number 52, number 52 is a solo game that I absolutely adore. This is The Lost Expedition. In this game, you are basically playing out nature cards, and you're, everything is trying to kill you, and you're just trying to survive and move your meeple to the lost city of Z. And it, like I said, you have three, three people to start the game, and you're just trying to get one of them to survive to get to the lost city of Z. I don't know how they're going to get back, but we're not worried about that. We're just trying to get to the Lost City of Z. And just constantly bad things are happening. And you're just trying to just eke out your person getting to the Lost City of Z. It is fantastic. I love this game. Number 52, The Lost Expedition. Going to number 51. Number 51 is a solo-only game as well. This is Under Falling Skies. This is like that arcade-style game where you have the alien ships coming down. And you're just trying to blast them out of the sky. And it's, you're using the a dice worker placement sort of system in order to do everything. You're trying to blast that out of the sky, making sure those ships don't come kamikaze and kill you and making sure that mothership doesn't come down. And I think it's just a great game. It's got a campaign in the box. It, once you've played the campaign and released all the, the little extra stuff in there, there's a lot, a lot of stuff in this box. It's definitely worth it if you like dice worker placement games or if you're a solo player, for sure. So number 51, the last... Exp or the Under Falling Skies. 
We're halfway through. I'm going to take a little take a little sipper here. It's a lot of games to talk about. So, going into the bottom half or the top half, however you want to think about it, number 50. Number 50 is an abstract game. Number 50 is War Chest. I love this game. It is this bag building game where you're going to be building in building new different little army pieces into your bag, pulling these out and trying to take control of so many different areas in this game. It's an abstract game, but it's really, I, I love like the little poker pieces in it. It's pretty thinky of how you're going to do things. All the different pieces have different abilities. I absolutely adore number 50, War Chest. Going to 49, number 49, going back to a small little card game. This is Scout. I Every time I play Scout, I just like it more and more. You're going to be playing out these, it's basically a trick-taking or ladder-climbing game, playing out these cards. And you're playing out these cards, you can't take cards from here, here, and here. You have to play these cards basically in order. You have to, you have to pick a chunk, a section of these, and play the cards like that. And how you're playing these cards is going to matter. And you're trying to basically enclose other cards to get better tricks in order, you know, you want runs or cards of the same type beside each other and i just think it's a fantastic game 49 scout going to 48 back up to a big big uh board game we got it right here actually this is champions of midgard this is a worker placement game that combines some rolling dice you're basically placing out these workers and then you're going to gather up these dice vikings and you're going to be battling these big trolls and sea monsters in this game. And it's like a really good blend of Euro style meets a Marathrash rolling dice. And there's quite a bit of ways to mitigate dice as well. So don't worry about that part of it. I think it's a great game. Champions of Midgard is number 48. Number 47 is a new to me game this year. I think it, this year is the first year I played it. This is Wildlands. This is a skirmish type game. Uh, up to four people play this game. You're playing out cards and you're revealing these characters on this board and you're either trying to, it's a race to five point and you can either get points by gathering up your gems that are on the board or by killing other people. So a combination of gems and people that you have murdered out on the game board. You're playing out cards in order to do these actions and I think it's fantastic. It is a game that I put off for a long time and I'm really sad that I did because I think it is one of the better skirmish games that are out there. And there's going to be a couple more skirmish games down on this list, just so, to be sure. Going to number 46. Number 46 is a classic Euro-style game. This is the Castles of Burgundy. It definitely has that look to it, for sure, in the older edition. I've seen the newer editions that are coming out, that have come out, and they look a little bit better. But it definitely has got that Euro-type feel to it. You're placing out uh, different buildings into your area, your own personal player board, and it's just a really good Euro-style game. Number 46, The Castles of Burgundy. Going to 45. 45 is another abstract game. This is Mandala. In Mandala, you're going to be playing out cards on this Mandala cloth that you have on these different Mandalas and trying to basically control the different areas of them. I think it's just fantastic. It, was, it seemed like it was really popular right away, and it just kind of, the, the hype died down immediately for it. But I think it's just one of the better abstract games that is out there. Number 45, Mandala. Going to number 44. Number 44 is a roll and write, or flip and write, I should say. But this is the third game in the series of games. This is Welcome to the Moon. First we had Welcome to the Neighborhood. Then we had Welcome to New Las Vegas, which I wasn't a big fan of. I, I really like the first one. Now we have Welcome to the Moon. And in this game, you actually have... Eight different scenarios that this game comes with. Eight different maps to play on. And eight very, very different games. But similar enough that uses the same system. That's very easy to get in from one scenario to the other. There's a campaign in it. In it or you can just play it as a one shot. I think this is the best bang for your buck. If you're going to buy a, a roll and write game. This is the one to buy, I think, in my mind. Because it's got so much variety in just the base box. So 44, welcome to the moon. Going to 43... Number 43 is another abstract game. You can def definitely tell I like my abstract games, but I think this might be the last one on this list. This is Yinch. The Yinch is basically a combination of Connect 4 and, or Connect 5 and 
checkers. You're basically jumping these different pieces. Every time you jump them, they flip to the other side, which is a different color. And you're trying to get five in a row of your own type of things, a type of color. And when every time you do, you score a point and you take one of these jumper pieces off in order to score that. First person to score three points wins. This is a fantastic game. I love abstract games that look like this, that are the the just so elegant. And it's part of that gift series that we got Devon right here too. I think most of these games look really, really nice. And Yinch is just my favorite one out of, in that series of games and just works really well. So number 43 is Yinch. Going to number 42, definitely not an abstract game. This is Blood Rage. This is big Viking battling game. And you think it's just this bloodthirsty all-out brawl of a game. But the more important part of this game is actually the drafting cards. And those cards are going to determine how your game is going to go, how you're going to score points throughout that game, which monsters you're going to get, which people you're going to be able to recruit. And it's just going to, the drafting part is the by far the most important part of this game. And this is a game that rose for me. I gave up, I gave away this game after I played it a couple times. I'm like, this is not my type of game because I'm not, I don't really tend to like, you know, take that games. And this is definitely like taking that to other people. But after a couple plays of it, after a I gave it to my friend, and we played it a few more times. I'm like, God, this is a good game. Dang it, you know. But yeah, so number 42 is Blood Rage. Going to number 41. Number 41 is a great-looking cover of a board game. It's a colorful-looking board. You know I'm a sucker for that. This is Rajas of the Ganges. This is a worker placement game that uses dice as resources. And you're going to be spending these dice, like I said, as resources in order to get more pieces, in order to buy these tiles that go in your own personal player board that's going to score you a lot of points and there's two tracks in this game that you're trying to move up there's the fame track you're going to move on the left side and there's going to be the money track you're going to be moving on the right side of the board and as soon as they collide that's when the game is going to trigger the end game is going to trigger person who's moved their stuff the farthest apart from each other basically is going to be the winner fantastic game rajas of the ganges number 41 going to number 40 number 40 is a very light filler type point game but it's a giant board this is caesar's empire this is you're building you're placing out these little roads on this map connecting your roads to other people's roads stuff like that and taking points and everybody who's part of that road that you just placed a, another road on gets points for how many pieces pieces of road they have on that particular road the the whole road so everybody's constantly scoring points and you're taking different resources, taking basically a set collection type game. This is like Ticket to Ride, but much simpler and much, much, much faster. It's a great game and it's very, it's, it doesn't look like what it is because this game looks like a big giant game, but it literally takes 15 to 20 minutes to play this game. And I think it is fantastic. Number 40, Caesar's Empire. Going to number 39. 39 is a bigger, heavier type game. This is Voyages of Marco Polo. This is a dice worker placement game. And what makes this game stand out from other dice worker placement games and from other games itself is the own personal abilities of all the characters that you're going to be playing as. The, the variability, the variety of these characters, these characters that you're going to play as are huge. They are very, very powerful and game-breaking. But all the characters are game-breaking. And you're you know, you, you're looking at your opponent and they're like, you can do that on your turn? That is crazy. But then you take your turn and you do this where you basically just set all your dice to whatever you want. And they're like, what? That is crazy. That is game breaking. All of the characters are game breaking. And that what makes that's what makes this game separate itself from other games to me is all those really, really powerful characters. They are fantastic. Number 39, The Voyages of Marco Polo. Going to number 38, going, going back to a Euro style game. This is Orleans. This is a bag building game. And in this game, you're going to be building out bags, buying new characters to put in your bag, getting that bag built however you want to build it. And you're going to be moving around the city, getting more resources, getting new tiles. It's a great game. They just came out with a, a drawn right. It's called a drawn right, but it's basically a flipping right game of this. I think it's a great game either of them i i like both of them i like the orleans a little bit better than the roll and write version of it but they're both still really good so number 38 orleans going to 37 37 is the isle of cats this is a drafting game that uses polyomino shapes that are in the shapes of cats 
and you're going to be placing these cats on these boards and all these cats are just laying around the board and you're trying to fill in these cats however best you can to mark to fill up all the different spaces it's a great game i tend to like these polyamino shaped games and this is one of the better ones i think and i love the theme of it these all these cats just kind of lying around this boat uh so number 37 is the isle of cats going to number 36 number 36 is a cooperative game i know i haven't had a ton of cooperative games on this list yet this is Horrified. Horrified is a game that kind of came out of nowhere where I didn't have very much expectations for it, but it blew me away and for sure. I like the theme of it. The theme you're playing as these people trying to kill the different monsters that are from the Universal Studios. You know, you've got Dracula and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Do you have them? No. Um, you've got Frankenstein. You've got the Lagoon Monster. Uh, you've got Dracula. The, you've got the Invisible Man. I, I really like the theme of this. There's a sequel to it that uses cryptids instead, the American cryptids. I like this one a little bit more because this one is a little bit more accessible. The cryptids one brings up the complexity quite a bit for each of the monsters because each of the monsters is going to act a different way. And But I really, really like Horrified. You can choose either of them, but I I prefer the, the original Horrified for this one. Going to number 35. Number 35 is a drafting game, civilization building game. This is It's a Wonderful World. You're going to be drafting cards around the table, and these cards are going to get you cubes, basically. You're trying to you're trying to fill out these the requirements to build these cards. Once you build them, those cards are going to get you more and more cubes at the end of each round, and you're going to use those cubes to fill out more cards to put back onto your thing and it's just this engine building game that just ramps up really really fast right away you're like i'm never going to be build be able to build all these cards but then throughout the game you're, like the first round you get like four or five cubes maybe or something like that second round you get like 10 then the third round you're getting like 18 the fourth round you get more so you're just building up this game really really heavy it's fallen a little bit for myself but that's only because i've played this game so much like i've 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 played this game to death almost. And so it has dropped quite a bit. It was, I think it was close to my top 10 before, but it's still really, really good. Number 35, It's a Wonderful World. Going to number 34. Number 34 is another Tableau sort of building game. This is Everdell. This is a worker placement game though. And you're going to be placing out these workers and you only have a couple workers each season. You're going to go through all the seasons. In the first season, you only have two workers. Then you're going to get like one more worker and one more worker and then two more workers throughout the game, throughout the seasons. And you're like, how am I going to build all the cards that I need to build out? But it really ramps up because you're going to take like wood and a berry Then you're going to build out this card. And then now with this card, you're going to get this other card for free to be able to put in your tableau. And you can only put like 15 cards in your tableau. Right away, you're like, I'm never going to be able to build 15 cards. By the end of the game, you're like, how can I get rid of some of these little cards that I can get rid of them to put in these bigger point cards in that tableau? Because the game just ramps up so fast, so quickly. Number 34, Everdell. Going to number 33. Number 33 is really well known for its artwork, actually. A lot of people think this is like the best artwork in a lot most games. This is Abyss, and yeah, actually, I have Abyss right here. Abyss has got a bunch of different covers, too, that go along with it. Uh, in Abyss, you're basically spending uh, spending these little affiliated ally cards to get these giant sea lords into your own little area. They're going to score you lots of points. Uh, they're going to give you lots of abilities, but then there's keys in this game. If ever you get three keys, you cover up those different lords' abilities. So you need to time this game right. You're like, okay, I want to keep using this lord's ability, but if I get another key, it's going to cover up these and I'm not going to have those abilities anymore. But if I get this it's going to be worth a lot of points. And when you cover the, the abilities, you're going to get these locations, which are also going to score you lots of points. So you, you've got some choices in this game for sure of, of when you want to time the different things. And it's a pretty simple game to teach. It's one that I don't mind teaching. Even after not playing it for a couple months, it's still pretty easy to teach people how to play this game. Number 33, Abyss. Going to the Lost Runes of Arnak. Lost Runes of Arnak is a game that combines worker placement with with deck building and there's a couple games that do this i i like the lost runes varnak right away i didn't like this as much as i should have um i played it a couple times i'm like okay that's okay and then they came out with an expansion that gave you individual character abilities and that really ramped up the game uh so i gave the game some more chances and i'm like it, i should have liked it more from the beginning but now that they've had these individual characters i like it even more and it jumps jumped up on this list hard on here 
So number 32, Lost Ruins of Arnak. Going to number 31. Number 31 is a debut for this because it's a new game. It's a new game that I was not expecting to like really at all. I didn't have a need for this. Number 31 is Splendor Duel. And, you know, when they announced Splendor Duel, I'm like, okay, a two-player game version of Splendor. Why don't I just play Splendor by itself, two players? Because it works fine as a two-player game. I'm not a huge fan of Splendor. I'd give it like a 6.5. I think it's okay. I think it's a good game to show people who have not played a lot of games. But I'm not like a huge fan of it. Splendor Duel makes this game much more strategic, in my opinion. It gives, it's much more cutthroat because you're definitely making sure, seeing what the other people are need or want gives you some more more things to think about in this game and that's what splendor needed for myself so splendor duel is way 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 better than splendor i think so it jumps all the way to 31 right away so 31 splendor duel going into 30 number 30 is a big giant epic game that i never play the board game version of it anymore this is gloomhaven and why i don't play it anymore is because it's really hard to get to the table considering there is a steam app video game version of it that does all the work for you and you get to play the same game but just but you just get to enjoy it without the headache of making sure you're doing everything right making sure you're you're moving all the tracks that need to be moved all of those get, take care of themselves i will probably never play the actual physical board game of this again which is kind of sad but the the app is definitely really really good so number 30 gloomhaven Going to number 29, we just had Lost Ruins of Arnak. This is another worker placement deck building game. This is Dune Imperium. But this one also has a little bit of area control on the bottom where you're going to be fighting. And it's got some hand management to it. Playing out cards. You're going to play out the cards that you're going to use to place out your workers. Then at the end of the round, you're going to use the leftover cards to use the bottom ability of those cards. To buy new cards to get into your deck. To do different abilities. It's a fantastic game. And... For the expansions, I really could take it or leave it with the expansions. I think they're decent, but they're not necessary. So this game has kind of stayed where it was, where Lost Ruins of Arnak jumped up a lot with the expansion. This one, I still rate it right about where I rated it before with the two expansions. Uh, going to number 28, going we're going back to the West Kingdom games. This is Viscounts of the West Kingdom. This is a game where you're going to be moving around this worker rondel style on this board. And it's sort of, it's a deck building game, but it's like a slow motion deck building game where you only have three cards on your board. Those cards are going to be activated every time. And those are going to determine what you can do basically for your, your turn. And each turn, you're going to slide one of those off and then a new card comes on and that's going to dictate different things. And it's just a slow motion deck building game where you might only go through your deck a couple different times throughout the game. So the deck building is, isn't is so, so important. It is important, but you're not going to go through that deck that, that much in this game, which is pretty interesting. So number 28, Viscounts of the West Kingdom. Going to number 27. 27 is probably my all-time favorite gateway-style introductory game, and I've taught this to so many new people. This is Century Golem Edition, or you could put Century Spice Road, which is just more of like a Euro-style looking game where this is more colorful, the Century Golem Edition, more colorful, more fantasy theme. You're basically playing out different cards that are going to get you gems, uh, turn certain colored gems into other colored gems in order to use those gems to buy these golem cards that are going to be worth points. And that's that's the game. It's very, very simple, very straightforward, but a lot of fun. I love this game. I love teaching new people to get this game. Number 27, Century Golem Edition. Going to number 26. Number 26 is Pioneer Day. Uh, you are in the Old West, and you're you're getting these different cards, and you're trying to... There is... There's these tragedies, tragedies, these bad things that are going to happen. They're, they're, they're on a track. And you're going to be drafting dice. And the dice that is left over is going to move the different tragedies so far along. And, you know, there's there's like famine and disease and different things that are going to happen throughout this game. And you're, you're just trying to prepare best for these different bad things that are going to happen. But you can see them coming from a ways away. So you don't, you're like, okay, this is about to happen. So I need to prepare for that. Get ready for it. It's a good little dice drafting game. Pioneer Days for 26. Number 25 is a very popular game. This is Viticulture Essential Edition, of course. 
And in this game, it is a worker placement game. You are you have this vineyard. You are trying to collect grapes and turn them into wine, sell this wine off. In order to score a lot of points, there are these visitor cards. And a lot of people don't like the visitor cards because they're very, very popular. They say they kind of break the game a little bit. I The reason why this game is so high is because of those visitor cards, because they can do such fun things to me. And it's just a great, great worker placement game. Number 20... Five Viticulture Essential Edition. So we're we're in the top quarter of the games here. Going to number twenty-four. We're going back to the West Kingdom for one final time. This is the my favorite game in the series right now. I mean, it's kind of flip flops with Viscounts. This is Architects of the West Kingdom. This is the simplest game in the West Kingdom games. This is a worker placement game that is. You don't have a limit of how many workers you can place in one spot. Because the more workers you have in one spot, the more powerful that spot becomes for you. So if you go to the wood spot, it's you know it's worth you're going to get one wood. If you go back to the wood spot where the other worker is still, you're going to get two wood now. If you go back again, you're going to get three wood. You can also like take other people's meeples and workers and kind of capture them, send them to prison. It's not that big of a deal. You can get them back, back pretty easily. But I, I really, really like the game, really like the simplicity of it. I really like the first expansion for it, the uh, Age of Artisans expansion that's automatic include. One of my favorite expansions of all time. Great, great game, Architects of the West Kingdom. And it has fallen, sadly. This used to actually, I think three years ago when I made this list, this was my favorite game of all time. I was obsessed with this game for a while. And it, it's just dropped a little bit because I've played it so much. And I've played it with some people who kind of soured the experience for me, I should say, a little bit. Because this is supposed to be a fast game. It's supposed to be boom, 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 boom. And some people, if you play it with them, they can kind of slow down the game. I like when the game goes really, really fast. So, But number 23, 24, Architects of the West Kingdom. Going to number 23 is another game that fell a little bit. This is Marvel Champions, the card game. And this is a game where you pick out a hero to play as, then you build a deck around that hero, and then you pick a villain to fight against, and you build out like a little modular set for that that villain to play as. This is, you know, one of those games that's similar to Arkham Horror, the card game, or the Lord of the Rings, the card game. I like this one the best, by far. Bar it, by our fun, none of them compare to this one game, in my opinion. This one has fallen because there's so much stuff for this game now that it's... It's kind of like intimidating to break out this game now. Not that it's a difficult game to play. It's got so much stuff that I just don't want to break out the boxes and boxes and boxes that I have of this game now. But it's still really, really good. It's the game that I've played the most in the last three years by far, actually. Because I used to play this game pretty much weekly. At least weekly, if not daily, for a while. So number 23, Marvel Champions, the card game. Going into number 22... Number 22 is one of the more simpler games on this entire list. Little card game. This is Hannah Makoji. This is an I cut, you choose game where you're trying to get the most, basically, cards on your side to control these different these different geishas. And there's a lot of I cut, choose, choose. There's only four different actions you take in the round. And every, ta action, every t uh, round, you take each of those actions at least one time. And a lot of them are, there's two of them that are I cut, you choose sort of, mechanics where they're going to choose which uh, which ones for them to keep and which ones for you to keep, and you're going to place these cards in them. Like you said, you're try just trying to control each of these geishas, get the most power on them, or most gifts, I think they are. And I just think it's a really, really good two-player only game. Number 22, Hannah Makoji. Going to number 20, number 20, 21 is a cooperative game. It's a very simple cooperative game, I think. This is Marvel United. This game keeps rising up for me because the more stuff you have for the game, I think the better it gets. The more characters you have, you're going to pick one of the heroes to fight as and you're going to get a deck of cards with that hero. Then you're going to pick a villain to fight against and they've got their own deck of cards as well. Now, together, you're going to be placing out these cards. Like, I'm going to place out a card and they have symbols on them. There's basically only three symbols in the entire game. There's a move symbol, an attack symbol, and a save civilian, like, superhero action s symbol. And you're basically going to move, hit, save civilians, or do different things. Very, very simple thing. But the next player who plays their card, they're going to play their card, and they're going to be able to take their actions, and they're going to be able to take the actions of your card that you've played. So you're trying to cooperate, playing these cards as best you can, in order to give everybody the best actions each turn 
It's a great game. The, the base box of it is really good as well, but the more stuff you have for it, the better this game becomes, in my opinion. It's really, really good. Really solid. Keeps moving up on this list. Number 21, Marvel United. Who knows where this is going to end because I did just back the next Kickstarter for this, and I'm going to get a lot of stuff for it. Um, a lot of new heroes, a lot of new villains. We'll see where this game ends up eventually. Going to number 20 now. Number 20 is another cooperative game. A little bit more difficult than the other one. This is Atlantis Rising 2nd Edition. In this game, you are placing out your workers as a group, taking these, these, these different actions, and you're placing them out on the island of Atlantis. And this, this board, this it's basically a star... Uh, it's going to be start flooding each of these tiles because Atlantis is sinking. And you're trying to take the different spot uh, actions of all these different spots. The further down you go, the better actions there are. But those, uh, those tiles can end up flooding and you basically can lose those workers for that round. Uh, there are other spots that are going to like make you roll dice in order to get resources. You're trying to get these resources to build this machine in order to basically get your people off the island and get them to safety. Another game that... I think it's a good game, but what makes this game stand out is the individual character cards that powers that everybody's going to get. Kind of like the Voyages of Marco Polo. All of these characters are really, really powerful. They got really neat abilities on them. And that, to me, is what makes this game stand out from other cooperative games. Uh, for sure, definitely the characters are awesome in this game. So number 20, Atlantis Rising. Uh, getting into the teens now. Going into 19. 19 is a drafting game. This is Nid of Lear. Nidavellir is this drafting game where you're going to be drafting these dwarves, and these dwarves have different colors on them. And all the different colors are going to score you points in different ways. Like the red cards are just going to score you the base points of them, and whoever's got the most of those is going to get a little bonus at the end of the game. Uh, the orange cards are going to multiply themselves. So if you've got basically eight, eight orange banners and you've got like three power on them, it's going to be eight times three, so you're going to get 24 points for those orange cards. You're going to score points for a lot of all the different colors in different varieties of ways and what i really like about this game is every turn you're going to get something good you might not get the dwarf color that you want but you're going to get stuff that's going to be helpful you're going to score points from all of them it's one of those games that you didn't get what you want but you still got something and it's going to be good for you so yeah i really really like knit of lear uh number 19 knit of lear Going on to 18. 18 is the very, very classic game uh, of for cooperatives, the grandfather of cooperative games, I would I would say. This is Pandemic. Pandemic is a game that the first times I played Pandemic, I'm like, okay, this is pretty decent. And then the more I played it, the more I liked it, the more it went up on my list. The, and now it's all the way up to 18, which I think is probably the highest it's ever been for myself. And I just think it's really good. There's tons and tons of different versions of Pandemic. I own them all because I'm a, I'm a fan of Pandemic. I like most of them. There's a couple that I don't really like, but you know, there you could just pick and choose whichever Pandemic you want for this list. But because if I picked individual Pandemics, there'd probably be six different Pandemics on my top 100. I mean, I really like the the Iberia one. I like the base Pandemic. I like the 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 dice rolling one. I like the Cthulhu theme one. I like the new Star Wars one a lot. So I like a lot of these different pandemics. I, I think it's one of those games that I would say is as close to a perfect game as you can get for myself. I think it's really, really solid game. Number 18, Pandemic. Going to number 17 is a game that has is an older game that jumped up. And it might be a recency bias because I played this game twice in the last couple months. And I always forget how much I really like this game. Number 14, no, number 17 is Seven Wonders. Uh, this is a great game that plays really, really well at high player counts. You're going to be drafting cards, putting those cards in front of you. You need resources to buy these cards, but throughout the game, you're going to get cards that are going to be resources from you for you. And you always have those resources. But you might have to buy some resources from your neighbors as well throughout the game. And you're just building up this tableau of cards, trying to get the most points. And it just works really well at pretty much all player counts from 3 to 7. I've never tried the two-player game because I heard it's not very good. But some people do say it's really good. But So number 17 is Seven Wonders, which has jumped up quite a bit. I think it was usually around my 50s, actually. So it has jumped up a lot just because I just think it's a really, really good game. 
Going to number 16. Number 16 is a newer style game. This is Cascadia. Cascadia, you are going to be drafting these tiles that have uh, little habitats on them, or types of types of habitats, types of terrain on them. And so you're going to be you're going to take the terrain, place it on your board. Then you're going to take the animal tile that comes on with it and place that on your board. And you're scoring points for all the different terrain types that you the mo the biggest type of each of the terrain types. So if you got five of the grasslands together, you're going to score five grasslands. And all the animals that you're placing out are also going to score differently. And they, there's a bunch of different variety in this game. So you're going to score points depending on which animal card you picked for that particular animal each game. And I think it's just a fantastic game. I, I like this by far the most in my game group. Everybody else that I've played this game with, they're like, Okay, that's pretty good. To me, I think it's fantastic. I love the ease of the game. I love playing it. I love these the puzzle of placing out your, your tiles, how you want to place them. And yeah, so number 16 is Cascadia. Going to number 15. Number 15 is game. I think it's moved up a little bit. This is Space Space. I, I find myself, every time I play Space Space, I'm like, yeah, this is a good game. This is a really good game. Every time I play it, I always forget how good it is, how simple it is, how I like how you get so much stuff on your turn. I love how you get stuff on other people's turns. And by the end of the game, you're getting way more stuff on other people's turns than you were on your own turn. And so that is fantastic. I'm like, throughout the game, like right away, I'm like, okay, I can't wait for my turn. By the end of the game, I'm like, I don't even want to take my turn. You guys just take your turns and I'm just going to get all the stuff from it. So yeah, number 15 is Space Space. Going to number 14. Number 14 is the two-player version of a game I just talked about. This is Seven Wonders Duel, which I think just is a little bit better than regular Seven Wonders. It uses sort of the same system, but in this, this style, the drafting style, it works really well as a two-player game. You have a pyramid of cards that you're drafting from, and you're drafting these cards, and when you draft a card, it might reveal other cards for the other player that were not available for you. And they might just get cards that they need. What's really cool about this game as well is there's three different ways you can win this game. Throughout the game, if you get so far on the military track on your side, you instantly win the game. If you get six different symbols for science symbols, you instantly win the game. If neither of those things happen, at the end of the game, you score all the points. And whoever's got the most points wins. If you've played Seven Wonders, it's going to be really easy to get into this one. But I, I just like a little bit more. I love that pyramid-style drafting system. If you would want to, you could have put Unforgiven, the Lincoln Assassination Trial game, in this spot. Because they are so close to being the same game. But um, I just decided to put Seven Wonders Duel this year. I think last year I put Unforgiven in this spot for Seven Wonders Duel. But they're very, very interchangeable for my, myself. Going to number 13. Number 13 is a two-player-only skirmished game. This is Summoner Wars 2nd Edition. I never got to play the first edition, and I got the second edition base box, and I put off playing it for a while. Finally, I got to it, and I played it, and I'm like, this is a pretty good game. And then after I played it, you know, a couple times, I put it away. And then recently, in the last, like, six months, I've started to really play this game a lot. I found a couple people who really enjoy this game. It is a card game that you're placing these cards out on this grid, and you're moving these cards battling the other person, trying to take out their summoner, and all the different factions in this game feel very, very unique and different from each other, yet very, very balanced. I am yet to play a game of this where one player just completely blows out the other player, and I like that this game is so close all the time. So number 13, Summoner Wars 2nd Edition. Going to number 12. Number 12 is another cooperative game. I told you these cooperative games were coming. Uh, number 12 is a deck-building game. This is The Loop. In the loop, like I said, you're building out a deck. Not not a lot, but you are building out a deck for your individual character. Each character's got their own individual powers. And this feels very, very inspired by Pandemic. But in this game, you are versing Dr. Fo, Fao. And he is going to be moving around different time time eras. And you're trying to follow him and take him out. He's building it. He's making all these clones. You're trying to take out these clones. And also completing different objectives throughout the game in order to win. He's going to be trying to basically cause time vortexes, and how he does that 
is wherever he's pointed at, he's got this tube. And the tube breaks into three different eras, basically. And you're going to drop these time vortex red cubes into that tube, and they're just going to go in random spots in one of those three eras. And if ever, ever there's more than three uh, red cubes in an era, that's when those they will vortex. Once you vortex four times throughout the game, you're going to lose. I really like that system of dropping those cubes. It makes it for the, a lot of angst throughout the game. And it's just, it's a really, really good game that I have just continuously broken out time and time again. And it's, it has replaced, I shouldn't say replaced Pandemic because I obviously like Pandemic a lot. But I just think it's a better version of Pandemic, almost. A very interesting game. Number 12 is The Loop. Number 11 is a big, giant tableau building game. Like I said, you know, you got that terraforming Mars, you got that Earth, you got that Everdell. You also have Ark Nova, a big, big, giant, heavy version of this where you're building out the zoo. You're going to be building out the zoo. You're going to need the enclosures. You're going to then need the animals to put into those enclosures. There's a lot going on in this game. This is a game that I prefer to play solo. I don't play it multiplayer for one reason. It takes too long, and it's very... It's a long explanation of how this game plays. So I've played this game... A few dozen times and I've played it only multiplayer twice I think I've enjoyed it but I would much rather play it solo I think so number 11 is Ark Nova going into my top 10 breaking into my top 10 finally we are here number 10 is a game that not a lot of people talk about because it's it's the less popular game in a series of games this is Lockup, a role-player tale. I talked about role-player earlier. This isn't in that, in that same universe. This is a worker placement game, and all your workers have different powers on them. And you're going to be playing out these workers on these spots, and you can place as many of your workers on a spot as you want in a turn. And whoever's got the most power at the end of the round gets to take the best possible action for that spot. But there are some catches. You are going to be placing the, some of these workers face down so people don't know exactly which workers of yours are where and you are going to be going around getting these resources spending them to get different different types of bad guys that are in this prison you're in a prison you're a gang of these uh, fantasy races I, I absolutely adore this game i think it's fantastic it is one of the best worker placement games and not many people talk about this game so number 10 is lockup Going to number nine. Number nine has draw, dropped a couple spots for me. This is Five Tribes. Still a really good game, and you notice that there's a lot of Bruno Catala games on my list because I just think he is a fantastic designer. And this is, let me think, this is my favorite game of his, actually. And you are going to be, you have a bunch of different meeples on these this board and you are going to be taking a pile of these meeples on one of the spots and dropping them off man call style on these other spots when you drop the last meeple on one of the spots you're going to take all the meeples of that color do that particular tiles action and then do that particular meeple colors action and you're going to get better and better abilities the more of the meeples that you use so if you get like three of them it's going to be better than if you just take one of them basically and it's just a great game. I talked about Yamatai earlier. I think this is just a little bit better than Yamatai. And by a little bit, I mean quite a bit. But Yamatai is great as well. So number nine is Five Tribes. Going to number eight. Number eight is a game that used to be my favorite game of all time. And it used to, and it was basically the game that got me heavy into the hobby. I liked board games all the time. But once I played this game, I was in. I was like, yes. This is what board games can be. This is fantastic. Number eight is Scythe. Scythe is a big, giant, Euro-style game that's got some fighting in, in it, but you don't have to fight if you don't really want to. Well, someone might force you to fight them, but if and you're trying to get six, basically six stars, complete six different objectives. That's how the game is going to end. And you're moving around the, this board, trying to protect your own stuff, Try, and you're going to get resources to spend on new things, like new mechs and new different technologies. And it's just a really good game that does a Marathrash and Euro-style gaming excellently. Uh, so number eight is Scythe. Going on to number seven. Number seven is a two-player only game. This is Radlands. 
I love the look of Radlands. I love the game of Radlands. Mechanically, it is so sound. It's a two-player only game where you have basically three bases on your side. And your objective is to take out all three of the enemy's base. And you are going to be placing out these characters in front of those bases, basically as cannon fodder to protect your bases, but you're also using those characters in order to hurt the other person, take out their characters, and eventually, hopefully, take out some bases along the way. And this game is just fantastic. It can be anywhere from... 30 minutes to an hour and a half for this game, depending on how you're playing, depending on how the game goes, depending on which bases you get from the at the beginning of the game, because there's a ton of different bases in this game. That's going to change the game dramatically because those bases are going to have special abilities. So number seven is Radlands. Going into number six, number six is another game that no, no one seems to ever talk about anymore. This is Castell. This is a very, very heavy, very thinky game, a uh, very Euro style game where you are moving around this board, um, recruiting the, these different castellers into your group of castellers. And castelling is basically building giant human pyramids. And if you've never watched go cast, castelling, go watch some YouTube clips of castellers uh, where they just stack everybody on top of another person, building these giant human pyramids. And that's what you're doing in this game. You are recruiting these people, and they're, the people that you're recruiting are different you know, strengths and, you know, the, the big heavy guys, they're going to be on the bottom, they're tens. And then you're going to be stacking like nines and eights, sevens and so on. And once you get to like the twos and ones, those are like children. And you're going to be putting those on the very, very top of your Castell uh, group. It's just a very thinky, very thinky game. And I think it's got, it's really, really deep and not a lot of people talk about it. If you never tried it, go check out Castell. I'm, I don't think you'll regret it. Going to number five, number five is another big, heavy game that combines Euro elements with Amerithrash elements. And this is a game that almost replaced Scythe a little bit. This is the reason why Scythe dropped a little bit. This is the Dwellings of Eldervale. In this game, it's you're basically placing out workers onto these this big board that's going to be slowly building throughout the game. You're going to be exploring new regions. Monsters are going to be coming out on the board and attacking. You're going to be attacking the monsters. They're going to be attacking you. You might be attacking the other players in this game. And you are you are building out this little engine as well. You know, on your turn, you're either going to be placing out workers onto different spots over there. Or when you rec recall all those workers is when you might be taking e the best actions in the game. Because you're going to be taking these those workers, placing them on different worker placement spots on your, your cards that you've gathered throughout the game. And taking those actions. And you can take a lot of these actions. They're going to be really, really powerful actions. And so, like I said, the best actions in the game are going to be taking your workers back a lot of times. And I just think it's very it's a perfect blend of a Marathrash and Euro style game engine building. It's just one of those games that's almost perfect for me, I think. And even like the dice battling system that they use, there's there's a lot of like dice manipulation that you can use throughout the game that's gonna help you. And even when you lose dice battles in this game, it's not the biggest worst thing in the world, actually. And so yeah, Dwellings of Eldervale, number five, and that's the first time it's been on this list because this is the first year that I got it got to get it played it was pretty hard to track it down for quite a while and I'm finally I'm glad that I finally have gotten it in the last six months because it already has made it to the top 10 that's pretty impressive going to number four we go from a big heavy game into a little card game this is actually my favorite card game of all time this has been on this list since it came out this is the crew Mission Deep Sea, or you could use the new one, which is, um, or the Mission Deep Sea is the new one. The The old one was the Quest for Planet Nine. You could do either of them. They're almost the same game. Uh, Mission Deep Sea is a little bit better, I think, but you're not going to go wrong with either of them. It's a two-player, or not a two-player, it's a trick-taking cooperative game, playing out tricks, and there's different cards that every every person needs to win throughout the game, basically. And each mission is going to be a little bit different. You're like, okay, this person needs to win the trick that involves like the six, the red six. And I just think it is a fantastic game. You can play it with a lot of people. You can play this with your grandmothers and grandfathers who've played trick-taking games before. I think this is a great, great game. So number four is the Crew Mission Deep Sea. Getting into the top three, number three 
is also another game that I think is underrated. I've got a couple of those in the top 10, actually. Number three is Circadian's First Light. This is a dice worker placement game. I love dice worker placement games, and this is my favorite one of all, them all. You're going to be rolling out dice, planning to where you want to send these dice out onto these different spots of the game board, and you're going to take turns taking your dice, placing them on those different spots, but someone might take those spots that you're trying to do. You're going to be gathering up resources, moving around your little, uh, I can't remember what it's called, moving around this little vehicle on a board, getting the resources for that at the, for each round. You're going to be trying to negotiate with different aliens throughout the game to get different points. There's a lot going on in this game, and I think it is fantastic. There's an expansion that's coming out for it pretty soon that's hopefully delivering pretty soon. I'm very excited to see what that's going to offer me. And I this is one of those games that has those character abilities that are really, really strong and break the game for each of those players. It's one of them. I love games that give you these really, really strong character abilities. And Circadian's First Light is in those games that I just absolutely adore that. So number three, Circadian's First Light. We're almost done. My throat is getting very, very sore. Uh, going to number two. Number two is a very, very popular game. It's either loved or hated. I am part of the group that loves this game. We're talking about Wingspan, of course. Like I said, you either love it or you hate it. I think it is a fantastic tableau building game. It's like those, it's like Earth. It's like Terraforming Mars. It's like all these other games. It's Ar like Arc Nova. You're building out this tableau of cards, and then every time you activate certain rows of that, you're going to activate all those abilities from those cards and get those actions. And I just love building out this engine throughout the game. And there's so many bird cards now that are out that each game, it feels really different. It can come out to a very different game than you've ever played before because there's hundreds and hundreds of bird cards and they're all unique and individual. And I just think it's a great game that I'm part of the group that likes Wingspan. Yes, for sure. It has actually gone up this list. It's always been... I think since it came out, it's been in my top 20, but it just, to me, every time I play it, I'm like, yeah, this is great. It's one of those games that I've played a lot and I want to continue to play it a lot more. So it is, yeah, it is now number two, number two, Wingspan. Going to my favorite game of all time, as of now, is the same game that was my number one last year. This is the game that I always want to play. It's the game that I'm most excited to play. It's a game that I play a lot. This is Unmatched. Unmatched is a miniatures battling game that uses a card system. You're going to be playing out cards. And those cards are going to battle your enemies, do different things. And there are tons and tons of characters to pick from. I think right now, as of this video, I think I've got like 43 or 44 different fighters that I have. I've got everything for this game. I think it is fan fantastic. I'm always excited to play it. I'm excited to explore new characters. I want them to continue to make this game, make lots and lots of new characters every single year for a long time to come. I'll be very, very sad once once they're like, hey, we're, we're done with this game. No more characters. I'm going to be I'm going to be a little bit hurt from that. That's going to hurt my soul a little bit. But I mean, I shouldn't be hurt from it because there's so many characters now for this game to play as. And I love exploring every character that is in this game. And uh, I think it's pretty well balanced for how many characters they have and how different each character feels. I think it's the best game of all time, according to me, for two years in a row now. And before that, it was number two, I believe. So uh, basically, one, one, and two, it's pretty good, and I like it a lot. And I bet a lot of people who watch this channel were definitely expecting it to be number one. Because it's it's my favorite game, and I, it's pretty obvious I think at this point how much I like Unmatched. It is, it's it's amazing. That's what I gotta say about Unmatched, and that will complete my top 100 games of all time. This is the longest video I've ever shot. This my throat is so dry right now. I'm excited to finally finish this video. Uh, make sure to comment below. Tell me your top 10 favorite games or your top 100 if you're really motivated. But I'd love to see everybody's favorite games of all time. Make sure to comment that down below. If you did enjoy this video, make sure to like and subscribe to see more weekly content from me, Shane, at the board meeting in the future. Hope you all have an amazing day.
Take care.